My name is Margo Landman. I'm Senior Director for Education Programs here at the National Committee. First off, happy International Women's Day. <laughs> I know all of you have been celebrating wildly. <laughs> You have Mei Fong's bio. I am not going to repeat it for you. I just want to say how delighted we are that she is with us today to talk about her book, One Child, which is really very interesting and totally depressing. I hope that the talk will not be quite as depressing as the book is. <laughs> And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Marco. And um, I just want to take the opportunity to thank you guys for inviting me here. And also to make a point about Women's Day, which is kind of ironic that we are having this talk uh, on International Women's Day because one of the side effects of the one child policy is um, an estimated 50 million missing women in China. Uh, so, you know, um, you know, this is the part where you can let the irony sink in for a moment and then um, I will proceed with my talk. Okay. Um, so, uh, the one child policy, um, and, and you know, this is obviously a crowd that is very involved in China, so I, I will skip over some of the preliminaries and basics, which I think you'll know. So. Okay, that's better. Okay, so the one child policy is probably one of the most uh, misunderstood, I would say, um, um, uh, things about China. First of all, let's start with the name itself. Um, um, we know it generally as one child, so when I struggled to think of the title, I was like, do I do 1.5 or, you know, you know and, and then we move two, right? So two, one. And of course, you all know that in uh, late last year, um, the Chinese government made the announcement that they were switching to a two-child policy nationwide. And, uh, and then, you know, a lot of uh, media said, oh, this is the end of the one-child policy. Yeah, because one, two, you know, numerically. But the problem is the name itself is a misnomer because it's just used to describe uh, the, the basket of, of rules governing uh, reproduction in China. So in some places, um, you, you, uh, I would say probably about 30% of all households in China are uh, held to the strict one-child rule, out of which about 90% are in urban uh, environments. But there are exceptions to the rule, which is why um, it's not strictly a one-child rule. You can have more than one child if, say, for example, you um, live in a rural area, perhaps, and your first child is a girl. There are exceptions that you can have us try for a second time because they recognize that people want sons. Uh, you can also have a second child, uh, most likely if you are one of China's ethnic minorities. And then um, you can most also have a second child maybe if you work in a dangerous profession, like say if you're a coal miner or a fisherman. Or very simply, you could have more children if you're willing to pay uh, because that's one of the issues. Um, so. Um, anywhere of a fine between two to ten times the multiple of your household income. That, that seems a lot, but um, increasingly there were people who could do that, especially given uh, China's opening up of the economy. So there were people who had a uh, central. So it made it very hard for people to understand. You know, there's always someone who say, well, you know my friend, you know, he lives in China, he has two children, or I have a friend, she's got a sibling, you know, so the one child, what is that, you know? So, so, so we'll start with that first. So even before the switch to the two-child policy, a more accurate name for it would have been the 1.5 child policy. But you know, obviously that doesn't sound so striking or memorable. So you know. So um, so you know, and also one of the things that made it hard to understand was the variable variable fines. You know, you didn't know how much you paid because it did it did vary. So this is a cartoon that was an internet meme in China at one point. And it represents a, a woman who is a family planning official, and the guy on the chopping block is, is, a, is an errant parent who has uh, broken a quarter, and she is holding a cleaver on him, and she says, you know, I can do whatever you, I like with you. You are just a meat in my chopping block, and uh, I'm going to pay 86,000 yuan. So one of the things that made it very difficult to understand, um, not even outside China, but even within China, is how much are you, do you have to pay? Because Two, say, let's say it's two to ten times your, your variable family income. Obviously, there's a big difference. And there was a lot of discretionary power that family planning officials had. 
So you could have two sets of parents in, in similar circumstances who might pay different things. So the analogy I use to explain to Westerners is uh, the one-child policy is a little bit like trying to explain the tax code because it really does vary a lot from place to place um, and circumstances. Um, and so one of the things you know I talk about in the book is you know the side effects of the one-child policy. And to sum it up, you know, it's too male, too old, too few. That's the problem. This is one of the reasons why they switched to a two-child policy, and there will eventually be more loosening, I expect, to the to the point where the so-called one-child policy, which is to say, you know, all sorts of barriers governing reproduction, will eventually drop. These are the last days. This is why I wrote the book. I knew it was ending, uh, but I wasn't any kind of a great seer because initially, when this policy was conceived about 30 years ago, they said it would probably only last 30 years. So. You know, at this point it was like 35, 36. So it's a little bit past that sell-by date. They are easing it up. The, this is, uh, these are the last days. So what we have, two male, what do you mean by two male? Obviously, China is a very, um, uh, is a society that uh, prizes the patriarchal line. You know, um, this is men uh, carry on the family line. They usually inherit. And of course, China isn't the only place where this happens. You know, anybody just finished watching Downton Abbey? You know, the end of that, that's exactly what it was, right? You know, you know, the girls could never inherit. It was all about the male line. So we're not talking just, you know, this isn't China alone. Uh, India obviously also has, this, uh, you know, thing. but because um, the one-child policy forced a lot of people to have a narrower choice in terms of their families, many chose to have boys. And so as a result, China now has 30 million surplus men. Um, and to give you an idea what three million means, that's the size of Canada. So um, if, you know, all, all these men, I mean, logically, numerically, it, it's going to be hard to imagine how many of these men are going to be able to, you know, find brides or start families, unless China imports a Canadian-sized population of women, um, which I, I, it's very hard to imagine that it can be done. The other issue, when we say too old, what do we mean by too old? So, well, uh, by 2050, one in four uh, Chinese will be a retiree. Uh, numerically, that's bigger than all of Europe. Um, if senior citizens in China were to form their own country, uh, they would be the third largest country in the world. You would have China, you would have India, and then you would have senior China. That's how big it would be. Now, that has nothing to do with the one-child policy. It's a simple function of the fact that we are all living longer. Our life expectancy is longer. You know, in 1945, the average life expectancy in China was 49 years old. Now it's you know 70 something. You know, closer to the global norm. So, um, but the problem with um, the issue is the one-child policy has very much diminished the, um, the, the, the support system, the, the working adult ratio that will support this huge army of aging people. So currently, China has something like five working adults for uh, one retiree. That's a very good ratio, very healthy. 20-something uh, years down the line, it's going to be one and a half adults to one retiree. So that's a huge jump. Now, there are lots of other parts of the world are aging. In fact, most of the developed world is um, an aging society. Because as you say, we all have, you know, we're all living longer, and we have smaller family sizes. But what took Europe and Japan 50 years to do, uh, China has done in 25 years in half the time. And so you can imagine from that point of view that um, all the things that you need to build for an aging society, you know, the, your, your social services, your network, your nursing homes, your hospices, all those things which take time, um, China's gonna have to find the resources to do this in a significantly shorter amount of time. We're very used to thinking of China as a, as a place of size, right? You know, world's largest population, 30 billion here, 20 billion there, whatever there. But it's not necessarily size that matters in China too, but speed. Things happen in China very quickly. When I was working in Beijing, we used to joke that one year is like a dog year, seven years. You know, because things happen so fast. You go away for two weeks, you come back, and some new building is standing where your favorite um, noodle store was. You know, things happen really, really fast. So, if you look at the, this is a population pyramid for China in 1953. And you can see, so, you know, typical, um, the largest base is for the younger people, folks, oh, zero to 45 to 50. And then it tapers off as people die, with the elder, elderly. So that's 1964. And this is where we start to see what they call uh, China's demographic dividend, right? 
the big bulge of people who were born in the 60s and 70s. And this was what helped China become a huge manufacturing powerhouse. Because as they grew older, um, they were able to go and work in the factories and supply, the, be that huge pool of labor that helped China um, become the factory of the world. So you see it here. But at some point, they grow older. And so it no longer looks like a, a pyramid anymore. It looks a bit more diamond shaped, right? And, but you see the base, it's shrinking. And that's an issue. That's an issue going ahead. So, Is that so, the male and female, the blue and red? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. Um, so, okay, and what was that last year? Um, OK, that's a projection, 2030. 2050. 2050. Yeah, let me scroll down a bit. Yeah, OK, yeah. Um, OK. So let's talk. So one of the things in the book that I try to talk about is what were some of these conceptions or misconceptions about the one-child policy? When I moved to China in the mid 2000s, there was a sense that the one-child policy was no longer that significant or important. It was um, not. I mean, you know, we, I was aware that there had been um, issues with force, uh, abortions, and all. But I think in the mid 2000s, most of it had said that China was, you know, ascending so quickly economically that a lot of these things were no longer happening, or if they were, they were rare or infrequent, that um, you know you could you know, get around it quite easily by paying a fine, not necessarily so big. Um, so that there was a sense it was no longer that big a deal. But um, if you look up, and, and one of the things that I think a lot of us have a tendency to think of, which, uh, and I hear this a lot in the Western, um, among Westerners, which is that on one hand, we do think, we do know, we have heard some stories about force or forced sterilizations or forced abortions, yes. But on your hand, China's grown so much, you know, and, you know, isn't a one child policy partly responsible for that growth for China's, you know, super size? How can you argue with uh, lifting billions of people out of poverty, you know? How can you do that? And all you have to do is go to China, try to take a subway ride during rush hour. You will totally feel that there's a lot of people in China, run high goal, that's what you always hear, you know? So, and I kind of really did have those kind of feelings too. I am Chinese ethnically. I still have relatives in China. And, um, you know, and I was all for, you know, you know, rapid economic growth. But the problem was when, one of the things is the, the policy, and I've talked to a lot of economists about this, and I've talked to them. So the idea that the one child policy was, has, has played a role in China's double digit GDP growth for the last 30 years, is not necessarily as strong as you think it is. A lot of economists, basically attribute you know, China's double-digit growth in the last 30 years to the lifting of the socialist um, planet economy control. So the major growth basically came from uh, more private investment, um, you know, encouraging private entrepreneurship, um, restructuring all the uh, more inefficient state-owned enterprises. Those were much more, um, you know, uh, much more, um, played much bigger roles. And if you think about it, as I said before, it's more people, not less that were responsible for China's economic growth because we are talking about labor pool, right? So if we look at the last 30 years, it was not that significant a factor. So Art Krobler, Arthur Krobler, who's one of the economists, uh, I think he's one of the most influential economists in China today, he said, you know, if we think about, um, you know, if 10%, right, I would, uh, if, if, you know, if there were, I would say that the one-child policy is less than maybe 1% of the reason why China grew so fast um, for the last 30 years. But if you think ahead for the next 30 years, the demographic headwind that China is facing, it is going to play a role economically going ahead. How significant is the crimp going to be on, on China's growth? We don't know for sure. But you know, you're talking about the China that we're used to seeing is a, is a vibrant China. We're saying world's largest cell phone market, world's largest computer market. Well, you know, a, a nation of retirees isn't going to buy new cell phones every year. China will be the world's largest adult diaper market, no question. But that's a, you know that's a different dynamic than, than what we're used to thinking of, and, and that's going to happen faster than you think. The other thing we talk about is you know um, this is a common number put about um, the the, the um, Beijing says that um, the one child policy prevents 400 million births, um, and um, and you know it's certainly a number that a lot of people you know just take for granted. Um, and you know, if you look ahead here, this was a, a, a list by the Economist uh, where they ranked the number of uh, policies that that helped prevent. You know, um, you know, uh, they were most responsible for 
uh, preserving you know, the, the world's ecology, so Montreal Protocol. And you can see the one-child policy is ranked fourth, you know, above things like Brazil forest preservation, or, uh, India land use change, or the collapse of the USSR. Um, but um, there are some demographers who dispute that now. And I looked into those numbers, the uh, 400 million numbers, and they were based basically on projections of birth uh, that followed a certain trajectory of the 1960s and 70s. So they kind of thought, okay, this is where our population birth trends are going, so we assume it's going to go ahead for the next uh, 20, 30 years, and therefore uh, we calculate it was 400 million births. But, um, you know, the last 30 years basically have made huge sea changes in the way we build families, you know, urbanization, uh, women's education, feminism, widespread use of contraception. They've drastically changed human behavior, particularly in the era uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in reproduction. So to sort of extrapolate from that using trends from the 19s and 60s and 70s, it's a little bit, I think, like, um, you know, trying a, a, a travel company trying to draw up a travel itinerary for people today, assuming that we all still travel by steamship. You know, that's kind of the analogy I use. Uh, there are some influential demographers who calculate that the rate is more closer to 100 to 200 million births averted. Now that's still significant though. 100 to 200 million is maybe about the size of Brazil, which is Latin America's most populous nation. So you can't say that that's not necessarily a significant number of births reduced um, and a reduction of the global footprint and, and, and ecological good done. But, um, one of the arguments I have, I hear very often is that, well, could China have accomplished this without having to go to this kind of DEF CON kind of version of one child policy? Because um, a lot, what a lot of people did not realize was, and, and I think probably um, some people in this room obviously do know it, but um, for the last 10 years before the uh, one child policy, um, during the 1970s, China already had a population control policy in place. It was called the Later, Longer, and Fewer Campaign. And the idea was to encourage people to get married later, have fewer kids, and space them longer apart. And so the population rate was already being reduced at a very significant level. So during the decade of this campaign, um, average family size went from six kids to three. So you could argue that maybe that birth trajectory would have continued without having to go to a, you know, such a, a very, very, um, uh, intrusive and, and hard to enforce one child policy, which is very, very strict, you know, quite drastic. And um, so, so those are kind of like the basics, and I'm happy to talk uh, with some questions about. So, this is the sort of the basic outlines for the story. But um, within that kind of an argument, my question was how do I storify this? How do I make you read? Uh, this isn't going to be just one economist style article but it's a long, full-length book. What kind of a story can I tell a weave that will make you interested enough to read to the last page? So my answer was, um, it needs to be a story of characters. And I start my story with a journey, by taking you on a journey to the Sichuan airport in 2008. Um, that was the year when I was in Beijing to report on the Olympics. Um, we had, this was the big story of China that we thought was going to happen. Uh, China was going to, this was, it's global coming out party. Um, the Olympics was a huge business news for my paper, the Wall Street Journal, because it was a big marketing platform for a lot of companies to touch that billion, you know, strong consumer market. You know, uh, uh, sell Nikes and Adidas and whatever not to them. But um, in May 28th, uh, something happened to sort of derail that process. Um, there was the, you know, uh, Sichuan earthquake 8.0. China's biggest natural disaster in 30 years, and um, over 70,000 deaths. Now you ask yourself, what does that have to do with the one-child policy? Isn't that just a natural disaster? Well, what I found was that um, the earthquake, uh, the area near the earthquake, the epicenter was actually a test pilot project for the one-child policy. So um, before they launched it nationwide in 1980, they tested it in certain places to see if they could bring down the birth rate was such a strict measure. And one of those places was near the earthquake at the center. Sichuan is a very poor and populous area, and so this was deemed a, a suitable test run. So they did. It worked so well that they decided, okay, we can do this, we can do this nationwide. So, of course, one of the biggest ironies 
30 something years later, it's not only were there a lot of children killed when the school houses collapsed, many of them were only children. I'm going to skip this back because the video doesn't play. Um, this is one of the stories, first stories I wrote after the earthquake. This man, Mr. Chu, is a phosphate miner. Uh, his daughter, who was 16 years old, uh, was killed in the earthquake. Three weeks after her death, he was in hospital to try and reverse a vasectomy he had to have as a result of the one-child policy so that he could try and have a replacement child. Because here's the thing about the one-child policy. It isn't just a question of, you know, you just have your one child or whatever, and that's it. Uh, as under the rules, you are required in many provinces to be sterilized um, <laughs> after that. Sometimes, most of the time, it was the women um, in, in Sichuan. Uh, for some reason, a lot of it was men. Um, so, um, you know, so he, he said, you know, it's not like I, I can't, you know, I still mourn my daughter. This is just, you know, it was still so raw for me. But I'm 50, my wife is 45. If we do not have a child now, a replacement child, we, we cannot live. You know, I visited them in a small village that they live in. They said, you know, our neighbors are beginning to avoid us now because they know that we have no children. And without children, we, we have nothing. We have no, um, we, they're worried that we're going to be these, you know, um, useless hanger-ons who are going to be boring and depending on other people. You know, we just can't live life this way. And this is the start of what they call shulu. Uh, this is a phenomenon in China. It's called, um, it's named, it's used to describe parents whose only child has died. Uh, there are about a million of them, and every year, 75,000 of them join the ranks. Um, and uh, they have petitioned Beijing for um, more compensation, uh, uh, because they feel like, you know, I paid by the rules, and now I'm going to be stuck. Because you know, to lose a, your only child in, China, in a Chinese context is basically lose, in many cases, financial security, because, you know, the, the uh, social <coughs> service networks, your pensions, and all of these things are not well developed. So if you lose your only child, uh, you lose, you know, financial, your, your pension fund and everything else. And that's, of course, that's not counting even the emotional loss you have. And also, you know, society, even though China, the one-child policy is abbreviated in the family structure, um, Chinese, Chinese society is still very much structured around the, the family. You are not considered an adult until you're married. You're not considered to fulfill your duties to your ancestors unless you have a child. When you lose that child, you, many people feel like they lose um, some sort of social standing and fall down the societal totem pole like Mr. Chu here. And also, you know, uh, in many cases, shouldn't parents um, find that they uh, can't get accepted in nursing homes? Because nursing homes will say, well, you know, you don't have any children to authorize payments or, or treatments, so we prefer to take someone who has children. Uh, same reason why um, some of them find out to buy burial cemetery plots, you know? This is the end of your life. Who's going to service the, the, the cemetery plot going ahead, you know? Who's going to come and clean your grave at Chini? And then, um, so, and another story, uh, another character in my book is this woman, Gao Xiaoduan. Um, I was very interested in the idea of documenting how population uh, planning officials enforce your job because clearly to make um, such a very unpopular policy work there had to be a variety of sticks and so and, and so I, I interviewed her she is um, she had testified in Congress before US Congress in the 1990s about what her job she was a mid-level population planning official in Fujian province in southern China and um, she and it was kind of strange. I, I when I went to see her, she she's now living in a West Coast suburb. She asked me not to reveal the name. Um, and this was after Halloween. And she was just telling me about how she just given out candy to all the local kids and how cute they were. But you know, at the same time, by her own admission, she has been responsible for something like fifteen hundred abortions, out of which a third of them were <coughs> about um, you know late term abortions. And she, you know, this is how it works in China. Uh, for, to, for a long time, um, you know, in order to make the officials themselves count, uh, accountable, they had the system called EPL Fouture, uh, one vote veto, loosely translated. So the idea was, if you were, um, say, even a garden level official, not necessarily a family planning official, um, at the county level, the village level, it was enforcing the birth quotas was absolutely, ultimately, super important. So. If the birth quarters were not met for that year, then you would have that black vote, that one vote veto, and it didn't matter how well you did 
the other parts of your job. If you met your economic targets or goals, doesn't matter. You have that black mark, you could be censured, you could lose your job, you could have your pay docked. So these were the kind of things they, they, they did to force people, to force other people to, to keep in mind. Um, and so she, um, Gao would describe how, she said, um, you know, at the same time she had a, a big um, difference between the way she lived her life and the way she lived, did her job. She said, you know, by day I was a monster, but by night I was also a mother. I had children. She had one daughter. And the funny part was she also contributed to one child policy herself. <laughs> Um, she had a daughter, she wanted a son, and she adopted a son, which is also not allowed for in the one-child policy. And that's the other thing, you know, if you have your daughter, <coughs> you are not allowed to adopt. So she adopted a son secretly, who was never allowed to call her mother. Uh, and that was how, you know, she, she, she tried to keep the two worlds separate. She talked a lot about how, um, you know, the other sticks involved. So one of the other sticks, if you might call it, that was detention of, of people. So let's say, for example, you, um, you know, you wanted uh, someone who was pregnant uh, with an out-of-planned child or someone who was supposed to be sterilized after they birth or whatever, how many children you were allowed to have. You wanted them to show up for the abortion or show up for the sterilization. They didn't want to do it. They disappeared. So what you would do, would you, you would detain a loved one. She said, usually we, we, we like to do the mothers because, you know, people wouldn't feel right about, you know, your mother being kept in a cell until you show up and you say, okay, we'll detain a mother and keep her in the cell for a bit until uh, the person shows up for the abortion or sterilization process. Um, <coughs> and that was one of the things. And also they would bill the person who was being detained for the food that they fed her them during that period. So um, that's one character in my book. And um, I'll skip through some of this. Um, and um, let's come to this period again. So, why was the one-child policy um, implemented at all? Maybe we'll come to that in a second. You know, because you know, on hindsight, you know, it seems so easy to say, well, you know, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Um, why was it? You know, so um, there was a new leadership after Mao, and you know, one of the things they staked their legitimacy on was the idea of um, raising China economically. So Deng Xiaoping set the uh, GDP go $1,000 per capita GDP by the year 2000. And uh, so the population planners worked that and said, we can't do this without going death con to the one-child policy rule. We, we cannot achieve this target. And that was one reason why, despite the fact that birth rates were already plunging under the later longer fewer campaign, they, they moved it up a notch to this. You know, as you see this quote from, you know, economic development is like a cake. We need to slow down the growth of the number of people eating the cake. That was how it was felt. But China was not alone in this kind of a uh, worry about, you know, the, the hordes of people that would sort of overwhelm the planet's resources. Because this was a big thing back in the 60s and 70s, the population explosion, the, cons the fears that the, um, the that, um, you know, the, there would be too many people that were overwhelm the planet's resources. This was a time where Paul Early, you know, who was a Stanford professor, published his book, The Population Explosion, where he basically, you know, um, you know, said that, you know, by now, basically, we, there would be some sort of a doomsday scenario. Um, what a lot of people at the time did not foresee would be the Green Revolution, that we would, you know, develop ways that would make us able to feed the growing population. Um, and so, against this kind of a scenario, uh, this the, this man, Song Jian, is a missile defense scientist, and he is one of the people, uh, engineers, um, um, that was sort of credited with um, drawing up the one-child policy. Now, you might ask yourself, why is it that rocket scientists are drawing up a one-child policy? What about demographers? What about sociologists? You know, what about, so where are all the social scientists in this? Um, you know, the thing is, after the Cultural Revolution, so many members of um, China's intelligentsia were demoralized and uh, had lost a lot of political capital and were frankly afraid to speak out. So the only um, members of the intelligentsia that were still left alone and who were brave and confident enough and also had the equipment and the know-how and they had computers and things were basically the defense scientists. So Song Jian is one of the architects of drawing up the one-child policy and their projections were based on you know a, a sort of a rocket trajectory. If we want to bring down the population to X, we're going to do this. But there was very little um, feedback or uh, um, or um, input by China social scientists into this whole experiment. 
Um, and um, part of this was actually, you know, does anybody recognize this guy? Um, he's Chen Xuesen. Um He is the father of China's uh, uh, rocket um, defense industry, and he was the founder of JPL, the, the Caltex Jet Propulsion Lab. And um, Chen Xuesen had left America in disgust after the McCarthy era uh, communist witch hunts. Um, and he had gone back, he had gone to China and went on to mentor people like Song Jian. So you might, in a way, see the long arm of the McCarthy, uh, Joseph McCarthy's um, campaign stretching all the way to the one child policy. This man is um, uh, Liang Zhongtang, and um, I call him China's Cassandra because he is an obscure um, economist uh, from Shanxi who basically uh, was on the record as being one of the few people to be against the one child policy at its inception and all the things he, he warned against, you know, the idea of a, a very lopsided, um, uh, imbalanced um, population, with, you know, the too male, too old, too few thing. He was one of the few people to speak out against that. But of course, like Cassandra, um, his predictions were ignored, not believed. Um, and again, he is a... Okay, this one, uh, do any of you know this one? So Feng Jianmei was a... Um, she was a woman who uh, lived in a rural area. She had been pregnant with her second child. And um, she believed, or at least they said they believed that they, they were entitled to have the second child because of their registration issue. But um, they had uh, population planning officials in the area had said, no, you're not entitled to have the second child. If you want to have the second child, you're going to have to pay a fine. It's going to be $7,000. Now, Feng and her husband were both factory workers. They didn't have that kind of money. So she played a game of trying to evade the um, population planning authorities until she could carry the child to full term. Many women did do that because the idea was, you know, okay, at least if until and when we can give birth, you know, um, even if we have to pay a fine afterwards, at least we have a child because the problem was before that you were kind of fair game. And so this, what happened was when she was in the seventh month, they took her away for a forced abortion. And this was in 2012, you know, this was the big issue. This became viral news in China because um, a relative of hers took a picture, a snap a picture of her next to the seven month fetus, which is very, you know, formed very much like a baby. And this thing went viral. Um, and this shocked China because many, many people thought that this sort of thing was, was over and done with. They did not realize that these kind of things were still happening in, you know, just a few years ago. This was, this was, uh, this is a major <coughs> turning point for a lot of Chinese people, the awareness that the one-child policy still had teeth and could hurt. Um, and then also, you know, I'm going to jump to some of these things, but I talk about these issues like um, the little emperor syndrome, because that's obviously a very interesting, you know, uh, thing. You know, what happens when you have a generation that is mostly made up of only children? How is this going to affect a nation? We talk about things like a baby boomer generation and certain traits they have. What does China's millennial generation have? Because certainly one of the major traits they have is most of them do not have siblings. You know, what does this mean? Um, you know, and I looked at a whole lot of social studies in that. There were, there were social studies that said there's no difference between children with only children versus children with siblings. And then there's some that said there are differences, but there are good differences. You know, that they're more certain, smarter. There was this major study uh, done by one of the Chinese um, social institutions, um, you know, um, think tanks that said that only children uh, tended to be taller and have worse eyesight than children or siblings. <laughs> but the one study I found that was kind of interesting, but I caution that it was one study, was a study that was done by the Australian economist um, in, about two years ago. And um, the study I found interesting was because they, it wasn't based on behavioral surveys. And it wasn't based on comparing children with siblings versus children with no siblings. What it did was they compared cohorts, children born after 1980 and children born before 1980. And um, what they did was they played, um, they put all these cohorts through different tests, you know, like um, uh, to test whether or not they were um, more risk averse, or not, whether they were willing to gamble, take risks, and so on. And they found very marked significant differences in the generation born after 1980. They, uh, they, the children born after 1980 and they tested uh, were much more risk averse, uh, were less uh, uh, sharing and giving, were much less optimistic. So I found it interesting, you know, and of course, obviously one study does not make 
um, for anything, um, you know, but it's interesting because you are talking about, um, you know, a group of people who are very shaped uh, by, by, by recess. So I, I balance that, all these studies against, I seem to be, oh yeah, people, stories of people. So one of the sort of little empress I talk about is this guy called Genova Chen. And he is not the first generation. The old, he was born in 1981, I think, in Shanghai. And he is actually one uh, one of the most well-known um, game designers um, in, 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 in America now, because some of his works are in the Smithsonian. Uh, he's very famous because uh, within the gaming communities because uh, he designs his games like movies. Uh, they're designed to evoke feelings of love or, 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 or sadness or nostalgia. They're not, they're simple shoot them up things. So he's been named by MIT as one of the uh, top innovators under the age of 35 or something like that. Um, and he talked about how he was growing up as an only child. He said the expectations were huge, 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 huge. This is the thing, um, when you, you know, it's not just the fact that they're only children, but they're only children whose parents uh, came from, who grew up in the Cultural Revolution and many of them missed opportunities uh, to go to college, and also all these um, expectations were vested on the only child. You have to perform. We want you to have so much more than we are. But let's not forget, the only oldest of this one generation is in their mid-30s now. Their parents are getting older, and too much is given, much more is expected. So he talked about how, for example, his parents now, um, they um, he brought over his mother who had um, uh, some bad uh, experiences uh, with surgery with glaucoma, so he brought her over to the States to do, to repeat the surgery because she doesn't have insurance coverage here. He said it cost him almost half his savings. And he said, you know, he's married now, he's living here in America, um, he could have any number of children. He said, I don't think I dare to have more than one child because guess what? I don't know if I can take care of my parents and any more children. So this is kind of the way I see the burden. So I, I don't necessarily see the uh, so-called little emperor generation as being spoiled or over, over grasping. I kind of see them as the wheel is turning very fast. And for this generation, it's uh, they're going to be so burdened by the cares of an elderly um, generation. And don't forget, you know, China hasn't really developed that social network that we talked about, that, that, uh, the Medicare, Medicaid, all those things that, that to the extent of um, many developed countries. So a lot of this is going to fall on their shoulders. Um, one of these other stories is the whole gender gap issue. In 2009, I read a story about how uh, there was a series of runaway brides in, uh, in this uh, small village in central China. And, you know, my imagination was fired. I thought it was possibly an interesting story. And I, I thought of, you know, all these women. I had this visual picture of all these women in bridal gowns racing across paddy fields, their veils, you know, streaming in the wind. And I thought, well, okay, I'm going to go down there and check it out. You know, what's a bachelor village like? You know, I, I, you know, is it full of men hanging around, lonely, horny? Um, you know, uh, you know, just you know, what is it going to be safe? You know, so, <laughs> so I, I remember we had um, we had one male researcher in our office, and I said, Carlson, can you please come with me to this village? I, I don't know, you know. Uh, so he came with me, and um, we went there, and then I discovered yes, it's a bachelor village in China. It's pretty much like any other village in China, which is to say, most of it's filled with old people and children. Um, uh, the, the young people all have to go out to work, you know, in the, in the factories and the big cities elsewhere. The difference is, the men come back because they have inheritance rights. The women stay gone, most of them, if they can. They don't want to come back. Um, so, so you know, this village um, <coughs> called New Peace is in central China, not too far from Xi'an. Um, was was just like that, so it was very empty. So, um, in this village, they had almost they had thirty eight bachelors on the books and no marriageable women uh, because of you know this was you know twenty something years after the one child policy, so there were fewer girls being born and the girls didn't want to come back. So all these men could not find brides. So, um, one of the things I hadn't realized at the time was. Uh, the custom in the countryside of bride prices. It's kind of a, you know, so you have dowries, which are typically given from the girl side of the family to the male side of the family, and bride prices are given from the guy side to the girl side. 
during the era of, you know, Miles Cunning, we're talking, you know, a set of clothes maybe, you know, something like that. But because of the shortage in women, the bride crisis in this village has shut up to something like 10 years worth of animal housing, uh, farming income, you know, demand and supply. So um, in this case, what it led to was a series of scams. So this guy, um, he, uh, Mr. Uh, Doping, his parents were really worried about him because he's 25, he had, he hadn't been married yet, that was considered a big disgrace in the village. Um, he worked in a fabric every year he came back home for Chinese New Year and his parents were like, are you married, have you got a girl? And so his mother decided to take things into her own hands. And since there were no women or brides to be found in the area, she, she had, you know, a friend of a friend introduced her to this girl who was from another province, uh, a foreigner. But um, she was like, well, we're desperate, we have to find something. So, so they arranged a marriage, but the girl agreed to do it for a bride price. Uh, which was, uh, and the family had to borrow a significant amount to get him married. And then after that, um, you know, after she was married, they seemed happy for a while, and the other neighbor said, okay, hey, have you got a friend you can introduce to my son? And she said, yeah, I think I got someone, and then introduced, and there were three women married off, and then within a month, all of them had disappeared, all the bright price money was gone, and all the men were left alone. And, <laughs> and at first, you know, I kind of thought it was kind of funny, because, you know, you know, China is, Especially the, the lot for women in villages is so horrible that I kind of like the idea of you know women striking a blow against the patriarchy, but at the same time you know there are a lot of women and this guy was really nice. I talked to him; he was very gallant, very nice. And even though he was the Joe Trip bridegroom, he said, "I can't blame this girl. I I I I think she was you know really uh, pressured to do this." You know, I talked to him. I remember um, in his village, uh, in his house. Right in the living room in the courtyard was a big motorcycle, a red motorcycle with uh, little handlebars with red ribbon. This was the, the, the gift that he had brought for the bride, you know, because he, he knew that life in the village was very hard, no place to go to, nothing to do. So he had bought this motorcycle for her, and it was still standing in the living room three months after she had gone. You know, I mean, life in the village for, for, for Chinese women is very hard. This is why China, for a long time, the suicide rate was uh, very high among women. China was unusual among all countries because there was a, uh, a place where more women killed themselves than men. Typically, in most other places in the world, more men killed themselves than women. Uh, but, you know, in China, the suicide rate was unusually high among women, particularly rural women for a long time because, you know, life is hard in the village and also you, you had pressures to give birth to the son and if you didn't, maybe you might have to go for a forced abortion or something. But now the wheels are changing because the suicide rates for men and all people in the countryside are rising. And the suicide rate for women in the countryside is falling, in part because so many of them have left. Okay, um, I'm gonna end it. Well, actually, I have five more minutes left, Arthur tells me, and then I'll, I'll open it to questions. So um, all these stories, um, and so I had what I thought was an interesting cast of characters. But I had no central character. And I remember telling some writers and journalists about this who didn't know much about China. And uh, somebody said to me, he said, you know what, I think I promise you don't have a century. And let me tell you something. When you write a story about China to Westerners, most Westerners cannot keep um, names straight. They can't remember Chinese names. They can't keep all those people straight. How are you going to keep you know, you know, your reader enthralled through it up? You're going to need someone to hold your hand. You're going to need a spirit guide. And so this is the point where I thought, okay, well, who's the spirit guy? Because I have a whole variety of characters, but there's no one central thread. Um, and so that was when I made the decision to write myself into the story too, because part of the story is my story. Um, one of the things, when I was covering the earthquake in Sichuan, I was pregnant. And I didn't even know it. So um, this trip that I had taken with a group of migrant workers back that took three days, and it took us from a distance between New York and Chicago, and we spent a lot of it walking and carrying heavy things. I was pregnant, and I didn't know it, and, um, and at the same time I was reporting all these stories about people who had lost their only child. So when I discovered that I was pregnant, I was of course personally happy in my end, but it seemed kind of, a, the juxtaposition seemed really strange. Uh, it, was, it seemed almost obscene. But later on, I had a miscarriage. And then later on, um, I tried IVF in China. And this would, again, open up a whole new different world to me. Because one of the things I found out 
was um, people were using technology to get around their one-child policy, productive technology. So, um, I'm skipping through some of these, excuse me. Um, so one of the things people did was to try and get, use IVF to uh, get multiples. Not necessarily because they were having issues with infertility, but because if you have twins or triplets, they typically count as one single life birth. So you are not liable to maybe have to pay the fines or maybe to lose your government job, you know, because that's one of the punishments too. If you work for anything that was associated with a government profession like a university lecturer, you could lose your job if you, uh, you know, broke the laws of the one child policy. So people were trying to do that. So in this particular case, uh, the woman had eight children uh, by herself and two surrogate mothers. She called her Baba uh, Kai Muqin, you know, Chinese Octo Mom. So, um, so, yeah, so, and then now we have this other issue too, which is, um, uh, the, you know, the flow of babies, and okay, I forgot to talk about one of the issues, which is the issue of adoption, uh, which is again what happened, right? Because uh, many of the, uh, after the one-child policy, many girl children were abandoned or put in orphanages. Some of the, uh, China opened the doors to global adoption. Over 120,000 children were adopted from outside of China, out of which about 70% of them are here in the States. So that was the flow of babies um, in the 90s, Westerners were going to China for babies. But now um, the flow is reversed a little bit, and now Chinese people are coming here for babies too. You remember Jeff uh, Bush made that comment about Asian anchor babies? <laughs> to some degree, um, uh, Chinese, some Ch uh, wealthy Chinese are coming here for, um, to do third-party reproductive technologies. And a lot of this is not allowed for in China, so for example, surrogacy or egg donorship. Um, these were all uh, areas which, because of the one-child policy, have been sort of driven underground and unregulated. So um, many people are coming here for this. So in this case, this man, Tony Jang, he's had three children uh, through a uh, surrogate mother uh, in the Bay Area. So, um, you know, so these are the sort of the strange uh, manifestations of the one-child policy. And um, at the end of the day, uh, my book, I think, is dedicated to people contemplating the cost of parenthood, you know, because I think this is part of what it is at the end of the day. It's not just a story about policy. The urge for us to have children, to reproduce, is a very powerful one. And so I think in some ways my story is about what happens when that desire is thwarted through government policy, through tragedy. What, what are some of the things? That, why do we want to have children? Um, what happens when, when you know, there's a barrier to it? Um, and what happens when you have uh, introduced things into it, like government policy or technology? Um, I think uh, one of the things I wanted to, to um, so there's the eugenics question too, which is also raised in the book, because one of the things that the one child policy was very explicit about was um, we want to have fewer kids so that we can raise the quality of the children involved in question. And um, you know, one of the things that certainly we see now is, um, the use of um, since re reproductive technology. So you started off with, um, you know, so a lot of them, the Chinese parents who come here uh, seeking, say, for example, surrogate mothers or um, Asian egg donors. So one of the things is it's such a major significant market that the market for Asian egg donors has gone up uh, and the prices have tripled. So um, I talked to egg donor agencies in the States and they say this is a huge Chinese demand and they cannot keep up with it. They are reduced to flying uh, uh, women from Taiwan and China into the States to donate eggs to make babies who are born in the States and therefore at some point flown back to China. So it's a strange, weird circular system. Um, and um, uh, there is a DNA sequencing lab in China. You know, this one is the world's biggest largest DNA sequencing lab, BGI Sunset. And one of the projects they have um, is to try and isolate the gene for intelligence. Now, some scientists argue that's not really, you know, intelligence is much too complex to be isolated out of that. But that said, they're working on that gene, and the idea is to try and promote the idea of being able to boost your intelligence by 20 points, um, you know, in, 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 in utero. So, um, you know, so we are getting to the point of this weird designer baby syndrome, and I'm certainly, you know, the Chinese are certainly not the only ones who want this, you know, when you have selections open to you, very mo more people are going to be, you know, choosing this and that. Um, but I would certainly argue that as 
technology opens up more doors. I was only seeing to see that Chinese is a major uh, force or you know a major uh, demand of, you know, for it because they are much more. The one-child policy has really uh, stratified or pushed them much further along in this kind of a thinking because they've already been forced to make choices for a long time for the last 30 years. So the structure of thinking is there. How many children, boy or girl? Um, now you have those who have choices. Um, you're going to choose. Um, Eight donors. You want uh, intelligence. You want a certain height. You want a uh, double eyelid fold. Um, these kind of things. So at some point, when the menu gets bigger, uh, I would argue that they will probably be a significant portion of consumers who will be Chinese longest because this is what the one-child policy has structured or created a mindset. And now we're at the point where um, you know China has. Um, you know, uh, China has been so successful at the one-child policy that now they are trying to reverse it. And the big question mark is, can they? You know, they want more people to have children now. This is why they moved to a two-child policy. This is why they will probably move to a no, uh, no restriction policy at some point. The question mark is, can they? Because um, every, uh, every uh, recent uh, loosening that they've made in certain provinces has led to no result in uh, baby boom. And the question mark, as you can see from lots of other parts of the world that try to reverse this process to encourage uh, the workforce to have more children, has not worked out. Um, Singapore, for example, Singapore is a place that a lot of uh, China looks to to emulate for their economic success. I grew up in Malaysia next to Singapore, and one of the things I remember was, um, you know, they used to have these propaganda posters to encourage people to stop at two. It wasn't as coercive as the one-child policy, but there was a lot of propaganda. One of the big posters I remember seeing was a loaf of bread, many hands reaching for that loaf of bread, and the big sign that says stop it too. Well, Singapore, you know, it's now at the point where like, don't stop it too, have more. <laughs> you know, they have government matchmaking agencies, you know, the SDU, these are called the Social Development Unit. Um, the acronym was SDU, they called it Single, Desperate, and Ugly. Um, <laughs> and um, they can't do it, you know, so they, they tried immigration, you know, with some mixed success. And so, you know, can you turn on the baby tap as successfully as they turn off the baby tap? And that's a big question going ahead for us. So thank you very much for listening, and I open the floor to questions. <coughs> yep. Hi, thank you very Thank you very much. I, I was curious if, uh, given the fact that China now has 30 million more uh, men than women, if uh, social expectations may change so more families may be more open to having girls? Um, yeah. Uh, there are some indications that uh, China's gender preference ratios have peaked. So, um, you know, traditionally, globally, um, there are about 105 boys born for every hundred girls. That's kind of seen as the norm. You know, nature compensates by making a few more boys because boys are violent creatures that tend to kill themselves and die off in greater numbers. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so in a place like India, for example, where they also have a son preference, but they don't have a narrow one-child policy, the, the, the global average there is about something like 110 to 100. China, which does have son preference and the one-child policy, the double whammy, has about 117 boys to 100 girls born. That's the highest in the world. In some provinces, it's as high as 138 boys born for 100 girls. But there are some instances that that high, that has peaked and it's coming down now. So I think there is every indication that um, that will go down. Uh, certainly it has in South Korea, which is sort of a very Confucianist society. Um, now the gender parity is more close. Um, and one of the things I skipped through in the presentation was China has had a secret, uh, a series of secret experimental two-child policy zones that affected uh, eight million people. So there were certain areas where you were allowed to have two children with very few restrictions, and those areas, um, the gender ratios are much closer to the norm. So there's every suggestion that with a loosening of policies, that will happen. But you know, babies take time to grow. Wives take time to grow. And you know, the problem with going ahead is not only does China have a much more smaller workforce, the missing women will also, how are you gonna grow your workforce when you have fewer women? How are you gonna take care of your huge elderly population when the traditional caregivers, which are mostly daughters-in-laws, they are fewer women? So you know, that, that's a policy. So it's not just a quantity issue, it's a quality issue. 
None of them saying men are better or worse than women. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned some of the. Um, <coughs> curious that you mentioned in the book that a lot of the um, one term policy that Genesis had to do with the complete repudiation of not only the Cultural Revolution, but even some of Mao's pre Cultural Revolution utterances. For example, the infamous, or should I say, famous comment that, all right, so if we're bombed by a nuclear weapon, we'll lose 100 million people, but we still have. And um, I remember you mentioned Chen Shen, but I wonder if you mentioned my Chu, because my Chu, I think, at the end of the Great Leap Forward, he had this huge argument. So that there was a very serious connection with foreign policy. In terms of, so I'm just curious how you evaluate it. Yeah, so um, Mai Yin Zhou, um, is, uh, yeah, Mai Yin Zhou is, uh, was what they called the, actually, ironically, they called him the father of the one child policy. So, you know, so part of the, 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 you know, what you point out very clearly is that part of the thinking around the one child policy was not an issue of economic planning or demographics or social uh, science. It was down to politics, you know, right? You know, whoever was in power at the moment had that idea, and this was the vote. So Mao, at one point, was all for more production, more people, good thing. And certainly that's one of the reasons why people say, you know, population in the 1670s jumped up. And, um, and Ma, the person you mentioned, um, which I talk about in the book also, was, um, you know, uh, the, he was the head of Peking University. And he was very much advocating for the fact that uh, population control, we should control the population. He said, unfortunate thing was, he came up with his ideas at a time when it was not in vogue to advocate it, because Mao was very heavily pro-population. So he lost his job, and he went out into a political wilderness. So he was suddenly an object lesson on why so many people were afraid to speak out at the time when the one child policy was unveiled, because there were very clear examples and historical repercussions for people who voiced something that was against what was the popular policy of thinking at that point. Yeah. Please identify yourself before you ask the question. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Judy, and um, I have a translation company focused on Chinese English. I wanted to ask about uh, the recent opening of the two children policy. I've read on NetEase that, um, in fact, a lot of women who want to uh, the second child are basically prevented from having them because when they go to job interviews, they're being told, the first question, or maybe the second question is, do you, are you married? Do you have children already? And uh, do you plan to have a second child? Basically, right now in the job market, especially for graduate, uh, fresh graduates, um, having a family already is an asset. And um, that's very problematic, in my opinion. My friends in China have been telling me that. I'm wondering. Um, do you know if the government has noticed this? Um, if so, are they trying to do anything about this? Maybe subsidized companies that hire women, etc. It is International Women's Day. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you know, so one of the big questions that you point to in this whole process is, you know, um, with this um, gender imbalance, with this shortage of women, Theoretically, by the laws of demand and supply, women should have the upper hand. But as you mentioned, with that issue of job discrimination, it doesn't seem to be the case. The problem with China is still a very patriarchal society. There are very few women at the top echelons of business or, um, or <coughs> politics, right? No top women in the Politburo at all. So, um, so unless that structure changes, um, you know, the shortage of women, I argue, is actually going to result in increasing commodification, most likely. Now, I, I say that and I qualify it by saying that the one child policy actually was benefit, very beneficial for urban women born after 1980. Because if you were born after 1980 in a major city and you had no siblings, you got all your parental resources, which is great because that was why women went to um, graduate school in greater numbers and achieved ever before. But if we see in the history of this country in America, there are backlashes, you know, to the gains made by feminism, you know, 
for example, in the 1950s, um, when the men came back from the war and they wanted the jobs that the women were having in the factories, they sent them all back to the uh, you know home. So you know, and I think that China is approaching that point too. To some, so we hear about you know um, the campaign uh, for to label unmarried women, shown you you know leftover women, you know considered leftover starting from age 25. <laughs> and when this is kind of really funny when you consider the legal age for marriage for women in China is 20. So between 20 and 25, you go from hot eligible for marriage to you know leftover. <laughs> That's 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 a really fast, you know. Again, you know, it's it's speedy time, China time, and um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Your question. That's okay. Uh, Joyce Gell, uh, City University of New York. Um, um, I, I'm just curious. You mentioned feminists in passing here, and I wondered. A, I I've always, you know, been curious. I, I don't think there's an autonomous feminist movement in China from my own experience there, there wasn't, it's connected usually to the party, but to the extent that there is, uh, are vo other voices, I mean, have there been voices during this whole period from women, or the picture you really present is one of control, you know, political control to advocate, you know, for, for this one child puzzle. I'm just curious as to whether any women, feminist or not, have taken a different perspective and what's happened to them. Um, there certainly has been a rise in you know feminist or activism you know along those lines, and we see that in, in the gains that were made. For example, China just re not too long ago passed its first ever uh, law against domestic violence. You know, they didn't have one for a very long time. So a husband could beat his wife, and a wife could go and report him in a in a jail, and he there would be nothing. He wouldn't face any jail time because they didn't have any laws against it at all. But insofar as the role of feminism in doing anything for the one child policy, one of the big uh, things they did do, which was uh, a big campaign called Care for Girls, which was to try and advocate for the fact that w uh, girl, you know, daughters were as good as sons. And so that is to some extent very influential in hoping, helping reverse this kind of a, a gender um, bias. You know, so that was that. Yeah. Um, at the back, yeah. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. I'm Eric, uh, college student uptown in Columbia. I'm just wondering, it's a wonderful talk, I'm just wondering if there's an inconsistency be between the individual heartbreaking tragedies that you portray and the failure to reopen the so-called baby tab that, you know, on the current PowerPoint. If the mothers, if the parents are so, I mean, they feel such a urge to have more children, and the officials have to go to the to um, fourth abortion to stop them from doing that. Why is it that the easing of the policy have not brought a wider uh, reopening of the baby tax? Okay, um, you know I think it's a fair question, and um, you know there are you know you know so you have to weigh the individuals against the bigger number, the bigger picture, right? So there are all people, and there will still be people who want to have more children, no doubt, no question. The question is, are there going to be enough of them? to make up the difference that China needs to keep going on ahead. Now, all the economic data suggests that, that that's not going to happen. If you look at cities like Shanghai, Shanghai is one of the you know, huge, biggest uh, declining birth rates in the world. I think it has probably the lowest. I think that and Hong Kong, negative birth rates already. So, um, so part of it, you know, so individual stories are one thing, and you know, I do talk about one or two cases where there are heartbreak, but I also talk about other cases, you know, which I didn't get a chance to flesh out as well, where people don't want more children. I mean, I talk, certainly that Mr. Chen, you know, the little emperor guy, he says, I don't, I don't dare have more children. Why? Because I got to take care of my parents, you know. So that's the counterbalance to that story too. So yes, there are individual tragedies. Yes, there will be people who will take advantage of this two-child policy and want to have more children, two, three, down the line maybe, but the numbers are probably not going to be enough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this uh, nice gentleman in a burgundy shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bond. Uh, and I'm, I'm well, I'm, I'm a graduate student in NYU studying international relations, and the only child <laughs> Um, I from, was a family, for that. <laughs> from a family from, uh, in Shanghai. And I, I'm curious that, uh, according to you, you have mentioned that, I, I find that the uh, one-child policy is uh, just a miserable disaster. But is there any other advantage of one-child policy besides economic uh, factors, maybe there? Because I was told in, in China that uh, we, we uh, may apply one-child policy because uh, in China we think that rice is before rice. Rice is before rice. 
maybe our first right is to survive. There's not enough resources for, uh, for all the um, populations for, uh, in China. So we, we applied this one-child policy for, for a while yeah, to make most of people maybe uh, have a uh, um, better living. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I agree. And certainly there's a point you make there. And certainly that's just one of the reasons that so many people supported the policy. But the problem, I think, with the thinking of the policy is very absolutist. It's like we tend to think one-child policy uh, and population control, we lump it all in the same basket. The problem is there is a difference. You know, you can, be, you can support the idea of reducing a population without necessarily supporting the idea of going, using, adopting an extreme measure as the one-child policy. That's basically what I argue in the book. Um, if you look at China's other neighbors, if you look at um, South Korea, if you look at Thailand, if you look at Singapore, if you look at Hong Kong, you look at Taiwan, all these places also reduced their population. They also grew the economy. And, um, and they did it without having to do anything as extreme as the one-child policy. This is the question. What, and the analogy I used um, is like crash dieting. I don't mean to sound facetious. You know, the idea is, yeah, dieting, you know, not necessarily a bad idea. Some of us could really stand to lose a few pounds. The question is, what do you do about it? Do you do it in a sustainable, sensible manner, eating sensibly, exercising? Or do something crazy like, you know, drink nothing but water and lemon juice for, you know, 50 days? You know, one will lead to all sorts of drastic effects on your health. And, I, and that's kind of my argument with the one-child policy. They wanted to do it so fast and so quickly. And this is the result. You have all these extreme reactions. And the thing is, don't forget, this policy is going on for 30-something years. You know, even if you, it was a bad idea, why did it take so long to reverse? Because some of this writing on the wall was on the wall 15 years ago. There are demographers in China, and I talk about it in the book, who are gathering together all this data and saying, you know what, guys? This seems like a bad idea because the birth rate is plunging much faster than we see. Um, we are seeing huge gender imbalances. We really should, you know, tweak this or reverse this uh, before we get to this stage. But it went on and on and on. You know, it went even on past the 30-year limit that was originally set in place. What? Why? Why? Okay. So um, there are theories about this, but I think the one that's most credible is, in order to make this work. A uh, huge, vast machinery was set up, right? You know, the enforcers we talk about. You know, you go everywhere from the state planning, planning, state family planning commission down to the levels in the villages. You know, this is you're reaching the people's bedrooms. You need a vast machinery to make it work, to enforce it. And you know, and one of the ways you enforce it was fines. And fines got to be so good as a source of revenue for a lot of, especially small towns, especially when they uh, did agricultural reforms and tax reforms. For a lot of places, in the end, the saying was, uh, okay, big cities rely on land sales, and small places rely on babies. You know, that's how you raise the money. So to dismantle this process, especially for you know, small areas, would, would take, take so, you don't just snap it over, because it took time to build up, and that's why I think they're trying to you know, take it down slowly. Yeah. Yeah. How prevalent, at its most prevalent, was forced ab ab abortion? Was it, in fact, exceptional and in some provinces only, or was it more common than that? Um, this is an interesting one. I mean, I've seen some big numbers out there, um, high tide numbers, right? I think in the mid-90s in certain areas where there they were huge numbers, uh, of, you know, we're talking several million. Um, I can't recall off the top of my head, you know, uh, but they were big. Um, and, you know, and certainly they were going back as early as the 1980s. I mean, uh, Steve Mosher, uh, who was a Stanford anthropological student, um, he was doing his uh, research at the time in Guangzhou, and he was one of the first to write his uh, a book about it. He talked about how he saw this going on at that time. And so, you know, the idea, so this was not necessarily new, but for a long time, I think there was, a, 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 a sort of maybe a refusal to sort of believe it for a while. I mean, certainly, I mean, uh, the UN gave two gold medals for population control, um, and one the first ever gold medals, and one was to India, and one was to China, India for sterilization, and China, you know, one-child policy. So, um, and there was a long time of sort of a belief because we, you know, that you know, coercion wasn't really a part of it. You know, I think we wanted to believe it more than you know, even when against the face of evidence. Um, and um, you know, even as late as 2010, and we're not even talking forced abortions. Um, 2010, Amnesty was detailing case of 10,000 sterilizations in Guangzhou. 
uh, in the city of Puning. And um, you know, 10,000 sterilizations. So you think all 10,000 people showed up saying, let's go get sterilized. And I'm pretty sure there were some of them who were not so happy to do it, you know, especially men. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, sort of in, in relation to that question, what role did sex education have to do with the population control? There seems to be a lot of talk about the abortions, but was there also advances in other ways of preventing births? <laughs> Well, uh, interesting. Um, there was a, the development of the IUD. Uh, there was the development of the IUD. Uh, there was a special kind of IUD that, put, uh, that was widely used in China that made it hard for women to physically remove it themselves. Um, uh, and also, one of the things I talked about, you know, one of the reasons why Sichuan was a place where there was widespread uh, men, where more men were, were sterilized than women. I talked to all the demographers, but they said, oh, you know, Sichuan used to be this joke among the uh, Chinese demographers. They said, you know, for some reason, Men, more men were sterilized there. In other parts of China, mostly it was the women. So I found there was a reason for that was because there was a doctor in uh, uh, Chongqing uh, who developed a no scalpel vasectomy, uh, which is a, still a method very much widely used in third world countries. And you know, it's, it's um, one anthropologist described it to me, he saw it, that he says, you take something that looks like a crochet hook, you stick it into the scrotal sac, and you wriggle about, and in less than five minutes, it's done. And they used to do it um, in, in, in physical places to demonstrate how easy it is and why you should do it. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah. No. So I'm sorry, maybe I gave you a little bit more information. Than that. <laughs> but I want to come back to your question, which is the question, how many forced sterilizations, or how many forced abortions there is. Um, you know, my answer is off the top of my head. I can't give you an exact number, but it was a lot. But maybe I want to pose this question to you. Even if it's not that many, can we actually say it was a good thing? Here's the thing, right? I mean, I, I find myself, you know, um, and you know, I am, you know, I might as well just say it right now. I am pro-choice. I'm not, um, you know, against um, the idea or thought of abortion because of any religious reasons. But you know, when I talk to people uh, today who are still, they, you know, there are people who are sort of advocate, especially people who are very uh, big on climate change environment. And again, I, 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 I also believe in climate change, but I don't necessarily say that one child policy was necessary to prevent something like that. Uh, you, we can have most of history in our thinking, but. You know, there are people who still say, well, on one hand, you know, yeah, we know about all this worst abortion. But on the other hand, you know, the one child policy was, uh, you know, it really did help the climate. It changed. We should all still have something like a global one child policy. We shouldn't have too many children. You know, the, you know, in some sense, the one child policy was somehow good, you know, if we balance it out. But, you know, if you just take that kind of thinking and you look at it in context, we don't say these kind of things, for example, uh, about World War One and Two. We don't say, oh, on one hand, World War One and Two was a terrible toll on humanity, but it did reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, we don't say, for example, slavery. Oh my gosh, that was such a horrible thing, but it was good for produ agricultural production. We, we, we've learned enough about history and about humanity, I think, to understand that there is a human toll that, that matters, I think. And, I, I, I like to think that maybe at some point we've arrived at that point in history when it comes to weighing what the one child policy was all about. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm Graham Major Hart from American Express. Um, I'm not sure this is a fully formed question, so bear with me. But uh, when I think about the story that you told about the handsome guy in the white suit uh, whose bride ran away with his money. Um, and then I also think about, you know, Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Hangzhou, cities like that that are very developed. My understanding is that there are actually more women than men in those cities. And so what that makes me think is that the urban <coughs> rural divide is going to continue to spread, um, especially in terms of the men-women scenario and also um, in terms of maybe having kids. And I mean, I'd just like to hear your reflections on how that will impact the urban and rural divide? Well, um, Beijing and Shanghai, in a way, are outliers, right? Because they are the magnets and the towns for attracting the best, uh, smartest. So it's sort of not really reflective of the rest of China. And maybe the problem is that so many of us foreign correspondents either live in those two spots as we don't necessarily develop a very balanced view of China without going up. But you know, you know how much China has more than uh, you know cities with over ten million population in, in so many places. You know that don't maybe don't merit you know a mention the way Beijing. But those are significant numbers. Being those are those 
those numbers, those gender imbalances are very evident there too. Um, so, um, you know, I think we need to bear so that in mind. So by that you mean like provincial capitals also have Yes, that also, I mean, you know, this, the nearest provincial capital to this bachelor village I was in, um, it had a population of three million. That's considered so small, so insignificant, you, you know, I mean, they didn't even a direct flight from Beijing. I had to go fly by Beijing via Xi'an to go to this place. But three million is the population of Chicago. <laughs> So, and that's a major city in America. So, you know, think about it that way. Yeah. yeah. A very short question. Uh, my this name is Larry Brimwell at Pace University. Will China allow your book to be sold in China? <laughs> that's an interesting question, and I think the answer is probably no. And, uh, and the, the answer is if it was, it would probably be in some form to be almost unrecognizable. I, um, three years ago, I, when I was selling the rights to this book, uh, when I was pitching my proposal, I actually did receive an offer from a major Chinese state of company. Um, but they wanted it with the proviso of you know altering any sensitive content. It's pretty standard. Um, and I said at the time, I don't know what you consider sensitive or not, but I haven't written a book. Let, let me just finish writing a book. I'll table this offer. We'll talk about it when I'm done. So I'm done. We're talking, and it's probably not going to happen because don't forget, in the last three years, the censorship issue has tightened up so significantly. Um, I'll say this, you know, the credit to Xi Jinping's regime is that they are loosening the one-child policy. But balance against that is the tightening censorship that we see. So, plus, minus. <laughs> yeah. But thank you for the question. So we will end on that.